we're going to go over the process of doing quick sketches. Um, and we're going to do three uh, in parallel. So we'll go through each stage of the process and then pick, switch to another drawing, uh, switch to another drawing, go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between three different drawings. So you can see the process developed three times. The first stage is gesture. And what I'm doing in this stage is, uh, in one sense, just looking for proportions. Um, I use halves, so I think of the head, the crown of the head to the pubic bone as being half of the figure, and then from the pubic bone to the uh, foot as being the other half of the figure. Um, and then if you subdivide that in half, you have the knees um, at the bottom quarter and the nipples at the uh, top quarter. Um, another concept to keep in mind when you're working with gesture is the movement. So um, in this gesture, not only am I looking at proportion, but I'm looking at how can I convey the action of the pose. And so you're looking for lines that are not straight, that are not vertical, that are not up and down. You're um, trying to express motion through line rather than um, through the external appearance. And this is basically a stick figure process, though it's very heavily modified. Um, and when you go through this process, be sure to um, include the feet um, and just have some indication of where uh, the figure is standing. The other thing that you're looking for is balance. So as the figure undulates back and forth and goes around the center line, you're looking for um, the idea that the figure could actually be standing on a surface. So a lot of times what happens in a basic standing pose is that the crown of the head or the base of the spine um, uh, at, the, at the very top of the head is going to be um, directly over the weight-bearing leg. So here I'm drawing in the weight-bearing leg and as I reach the bottom of it you'll see that um, that, that heel uh, is under the head. The second stage that we move into is the stage where you block in the forms. Uh, the most important thing to do here is find your three major masses. Um, the gesture stage has already established the head so that mass is done. Uh, right now I'm working into the rib cage. I'm using just a little bit of anatomical detail to articulate where the sternum is. Um, the other major mass is the pelvis, um, and that the interaction of the head, the rib cage, and the pelvis kind of defines the entire action of the pose. Um, and if you can get those three masses in proportion, um, you'll have a pretty good uh, idea of what the figure is going to look like. So here, uh, I'm working down in through the, using the stomach lines and the connection of the leg to define exactly where that uh, um, the pelvis is. And then as you move through the forms, you can do things like use contour to find the form, but you can also wrap lines around it. So the leg is basically just a series of, of a couple of cylinders and uh, you can treat it as such, and you can modify the, the form as necessary um, to be accurate as you go along. Or you can just do a basic cylinder and uh, modify it later. As you do this, be sure that you don't avoid the head, hands, and feet. Um, even if you're, you do this improperly and it looks a little weird, take a stab at the foot and just see what it, what it might look like. Um, and always be um, re-observing, um, looking at at the forms to go back and convey the three con three major concepts of gesture: the proportion, the movement, and the balance. So, here, as I do the uh, weight-bearing leg of this figure, um, you'll see that I'm trying to connect it back up to the head and make sure that the figure does stay balanced. Um, and you'll notice here when I get down to the foot. That I do make a um, that I do need to make a correction. I've come down and I found uh, where the foot where the foot needs to go, and it's uh, and it needs to be a little bit higher up on the page. So 
simply moving and cutting off um, uh, is still possible throughout these throughout these stages. You can always adjust. Um, another thing to think about is grounding the figure. Um, as you go through and find these three major masses, you're establishing balance and movement and proportion, but you're also looking ultimately to make sure that the that the figure has some kind of connection to the ground. Um, and the other thing that you can look for is is uh, the first stages of finding surface landmarks. So um, the major obvious sur surface landmarks are anywhere that a bone protrudes to the surface of the skin. So that's obviously the iliac crest in the pelvis, the solar plexus um, on the rib cage, uh, the pubic bone itself, the clavicles are also good, the knees, um, any place where on on everyone you see a actual uh, bone protrusion is what we call a surface landmark. And you can see here that I'm mixing in uh, little bits of surface landmarks and overlapping forms um, as well as the uh, cylindrical approach. So um, if you're looking for uh, ways to break down feet, um, a lot of uh, comic book artists have great um, uh, economical ways to uh, to um, do feet in just a few in just a few lines. But remember that those lines were also uh, developed from the old masters. So if you go back and look at old master drawings, um, you'll find um, lines and forms that you can use to express certain situations and copying old masters is, is a great way to just um, program uh, yourself to analyze similar situations in the ways that they did and uh, that's always useful. So um, most people when they draw are obsessed with uh, getting the contour, the shape right of the, uh, of the figure and that is important. You do eventually want to get to a recognizable shape, a recognizable contour. But in the early stages of a drawing, any line that you can put inside the edges um, is a great, great tool. So um, using things like the ankles um, that are inside the edge and uh, using finding the corners of forms, even though there aren't really any corners on the body, um, you can kind of box things out um, as if as if they were there. Um, so here in this in this third drawing, you'll see the interaction of the forms and the gesture lines. And sometimes the gesture lines become part of the forms, and other times they don't. Sometimes the gesture line has uh, very little to do with the final forms. It's just establishing something for you to measure off of. Um, and the value of a gesture is that it doesn't have to stay that way. You can sort of ignore it through the rest of the process, but it does give you something to measure off of. Um, and then the other thing that you're trying to do is, is uh, you check to make sure that, that um, the forms go back and they reinforce the concepts of the gesture. Even if the lines don't have anything in common. Um, you want to make sure that you are reinforcing proportion, you're reobserving movement, you're reobserving balance, you're making corrections and, and additions, and that you're not stuck with what you did on the first on the first time. So you see here on the leg that uh, the initial gesture mark of this front leg has become sort of the corner of the form and helps define the form, um, which is great because that's still that becomes a very economical way to draw. Um, moving into the third stage, um, we need to define the smaller forms. So one of the ways to do that is start connecting your three major masses. Um, if you haven't drawn a neck and you haven't drawn uh, sort of an, uh, ab an abdomen, then it would be time to connect the rib cage to the pelvis and then, of course, connect the arms uh, to the rib cage. The clavicles are the first thing that you usually do that or the um, 
or the uh, shoulder blades on the back and that can help you make that connection or start to make that connection really quickly. And I'm looking for a little bit of anatomy to kind of be able to wrap lines around the arm. And uh, keep in mind that I'm still working with basic, um, basic, basic cylinders. Um, whenever I'm, I'm using photo references here, and whenever you're using photo references, you want to be sure that uh, that you're not addicted to what the actual photo looks like, that you're analyzing what the photo is telling you about a form. Um, and when you get to the head, uh, I'm working on a very small scale here, so um, I don't have a lot of, of uh, room to maneuver as far as getting facial features in. But I'm going to take a stab at it, right? I'm going to put in an indication of where the nose would be, where the mouth would be, um, where the eyes are, and, uh, and make an initial guess. And here you see I messed up right there um, and um, added a too heavy line on the, on the pectoral muscle and the contour of the breast. And that's okay because you can go back and kind of fix that later and it becomes, and the mistake becomes uh, less evident as you go through the process. So, um, when you get to the hands, you know, you're not gonna be able on this, on this scale to draw each finger um, very accurately. So, but do indicate the direction of the fingers and where they're going. Everyone has trouble with hair, um, and I was told, told to think of hair as a helmet with strands. Um, so, it is a form in and of itself that sits on top of the head. Um, so don't be afraid to use your knowledge of form to be able to draw the hair. So here I uh, had not drawn in the, uh, the arms as part of the gesture, but that's a critical part. Um, I've defined a lot of the movement and a lot of the forms, so I'm just going back and making sure that, that uh, yeah, these smaller forms, the arms, do get, uh, do get placed into the, into the body before I get, a lot, get too far along. Um, one of the problems that I see uh, a lot of people having is that they overdevelop certain parts of the figure and leave um, uh, other parts blank. So if you have an overdeveloped head um, and a very sketchy figure, that creates a problem um, and vice versa. If you just leave feet blank and get done with the drawing and then you have to come back to the feet, you've um, created a problem for yourself. You've put too much, um, too much weight uh, mental weight on the feet, and then it becomes a very pressured thing to try to get them in. You can also bring in um, any an any anatomy that you know. Um, you know, when you're working with the chest, uh, even on females, you're still working with the basic pectoral muscle, um, and that is the same for all people. Um, everyone has those muscles, so um, most people. Uh, get thrown off by that. When you work into the shoulder, you're working in a very complex interaction of highly movable forms. So you have to make sure that the motion is right and use those um, use those cylinders and the and the way the forms overlap. Um, one of the most fun ways to get forms to overlap is to use the the bean forms. And uh, Glenn Villepue talks about those a lot. Um, he's a big influence on me, obviously, and um, uh, those bean forms are very powerful for being able to get forms to overlap um, uh, quickly and painlessly. And so here I haven't drawn in that the, the bottom of the leg or the back leg at all, so it's about time before I go any further to, to go ahead and finish out that process. And then um, I found a corner of a box on that leg, but it's also a round leg, so I'm using, um, I'm mixing in uh, cylinders and boxes to create a more uh, curved form. And I like to be very patient with this. I don't like to set myself a time limit for drawings. I like to just um, go through the process stage by stage and not worry about uh, the pressures of drawing within 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever.
Um, things still move quickly because I am pushing to move through the process. So one of the things that you that you need to do is draw through forms. So that back leg is drawn pretty much directly through the front leg so that you know where the back leg ends up. If you don't know uh, how the back leg passes through, you could put it off in some weird area um, and create a, an interesting anatomical distortion. And I've noticed that I've almost got the neck in, but I don't have the trapezius muscles, so knocking those in connects the uh, neck to the shoulders. And here again, I'm working with hair, so I'm thinking of the hair as a, as a mass that sits on top of the skull um, and treating it as a, as a larger form. Um, I'm being kind of loose with it because it, uh, the hair of this model was kind of um, crazy. And then a little nick and, you, and a couple of dots, and you've indicated the nose and the eyes and another nick, and you've indicated where the mouth is. Um, and that's as far as it needs to go for a quick sketch. Um, if you were doing a study for a fully developed drawing, you know, you might want to take it a little bit further. The other thing that you need to do in a drawing is uh, be sure that you skip around um, uh, and move through in passes. So um, what's happening is that, uh, that each time I go through the drawing, it becomes more refined. And right now, I'm finding surface landmarks, the nipples, the belly button, um, any kind of uh, bone landmarks. And then I um, can use a little bit of, uh, of uh, form-following modeling tone. I can work, uh, work with the contour a little bit. I can use um, some hatching uh, if I want, and just be sure that forms overlap. Um, so here, I'm using a little bit of modeling tone uh, bringing in uh, what will eventually become a sense of light. I'm trying to do everything that I can to get these forms to bend and turn in space. And uh, hatching is one of the most basic ways to do that. And so every time the form bends, the line bends in a slightly different direction. And I want that uh, section to kind of flatten out, so I'm using straight hatching there. Um, and you'll notice that that sort of puts that leg into the background. And here I'm following the contour of the of the leg as it goes around, so that the form uh, is defined by every single mark. And so, if you have a uh, interior form, one that doesn't define the outer contour of the body, hatching is a great way to use that tone. And then I'm also bringing in a little bit of the idea of local value, that the hair is just simply darker than the rest of the body. So I make the hair dark. Um, it's a very simple technique, but, but very powerful. And here again, I'm working with, uh, with surface landmarks, using those hatch marks to uh, go around the uh, edges of the interior forms so that I'd, I'm not creating too many, uh, too many contour lines within the figure because that can flatten and two-dimensionalize things. And it's very difficult to do this uh, from photo references. It's a little bit easier when, when uh, you're working from a model in person. Um, and each layer that I do is, is uh, reinforcing what I did previously if it's correct. Um, otherwise, I'm making corrections and I'm re-observing. Um, I'm not necessarily, I don't think you have to always um, stick to what you put down first. Um, if you stick to what, down, what you put down first, you may f be stuck with a mistake that you made earlier on. Because as you're, as you're um, drawing, you're gaining knowledge of the form. You're learning what the figure is doing. Um, you're thinking through it. You're analyzing. Um, and you can see a lot of times that I'll make uh, a mark in the air before I make a mark with a pen. So I'm slowing down and kind of just thinking through what am I going to do next? How is that going to look? And practicing. And then if I missed any areas in the previous steps, like I forgot to put in a form because I got so focused on something else, then I'm then I need to go back at back a step and make sure that I've added things like I've added the neck or I've added all the anatomy of the arms that I need to. Um, 
And one of the things that you can look for as you go through um, forms like this is just basic, the idea of basic overlap. You know, one thing, the simplest way to create depth is to put one thing in front of another. Um, so if I overlap forms, then uh, I automatically create depth. Um, it's very simple and, and it's uh, often undervalued or looked over in the, in the process, but um, it's super powerful uh, when you can, when you can uh, create depth with overlap and it's very satisfying. So again, um, working through the smaller features and working through the hair, just taking, taking a stab at it. It doesn't have to be correct on this go and you'll see um, the things have gotten a little heavy in that area, but that's okay because you can make corrections. And so the more you know about anatomy and musculature, the better off you are going to be. Um, when you study old master drawings, they knew the location and direction and the way muscles would turn in every possible direction. So um, go get out the anatomy books and, and really study um, and you'll be able to convey more information. Again, the hair is simply dark, so you can make it dark. Um, and this isn't necessarily, the idea of a quick sketch isn't necessarily to create a fully rendered drawing, but it's mostly to explore form and to maybe, uh, if you have time, create a sense of the light or how the light might fall on a figure. Um, and when you're drawing from photo references, you don't get control of the light. so. Um, you can make adaptations uh, to the light to show off the forms that, that you've established. Um, and learning how to do cross-hatching is something that uh, is very um, uh, simple to do once you have done, uh, once you've explored forms. So if you're still having trouble with forms, it might be worthwhile to go back and just draw some boxes, draw some cylinders, um, and use uh, hatching to define the way the planes change in those forms. Um, if you go out and draw uh, draw rocks in your backyard or something like that, um, boulders, anything anything like that that have strong planes, that'll help as well. So with this third figure. Um, this is kind of all basically laid out, so um, I can use a little bit of a uh, little bit of the modeling tone. Keep reobserving, checking, measuring. Um, use cross hatching to uh, define forms and the way forms bend around each other. So if you've done those cylindrical wrapping lines. That gives you an indication of the direction that you should be hatching in. Um, and one of the most basic ideas of value drawing is that if there's a change in plane, there's a change in value. So um, similarly with hatching, if there's a change in the direction of the plane, there should be a change in the direction of your hatch marks. Um, so one of the interesting things that you can do here uh, with this hair is you get the sense that the hair is overlapping the forehead um, and then the cheek is overlapping the hair. Um, and being able to control edges like that is a uh, uh, particularly good uh, technique to use. So here around the armpit I'm deciding which line overlapped which and I'm building outward to the final to the final contour. And then she's draped with some fabric, so um, now that I've built the figure uh, first, then I can come back and, and clothe it and build um, build out this, uh, this swath of fabric that she has. But you don't want to do it the other way around first. You don't want to begin with the fabric and then, uh, then build the figure, because the fabric will be in the way, and you want to create a sense that the fabric is going over the figure. So if you build the figure first, um, as if 
it, as if it were not glowed and then clothe it, then your, um, your chances of getting the sense that it's fabric on top of anatomy uh, is going to be a lot stronger. And so the fabric ultimately has to reinforce the anatomy. So you can see that uh, the fabric lines are wrapping around the anatomy, just like uh, just like you drew those cylinders in. And always going back and adding surface landmarks and and reobserving proportions and and movement. So the nice thing about hatching like this and following the form marks is that you're always reinforcing movement and you're always reinforcing form. One of the simplest um, ways to do a tone if you don't have a very good lighting situation is just to think of it as um, whatever is closest to you is brighter and whatever is further away is darker. And here the, um, the technique uh, changes a little bit. So, so far I've been using a fountain pen to draw out these figures. And uh, the joy of a fountain pen is that it, the ink is water soluble. Um, so I can take a very cheesy uh, but awesome watercolors tool, the, the water brush, and, uh, or any kind of brush with water in it, and just bleed the ink around. Um, and this creates um, what, what's called the poster effect. So the simplest way to, to begin to create a sense of light is um, to divide light and dark and make whatever is in shadow uh, a medium dark and then leave blank whatever is in the light. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just doing it with ink wash instead of charcoal or something else. So when this happens, you'll see a distinct uh, uh, change in plane and the forms really begin to emerge. Of course this isn't necessary for the structural drawing technique, it's just really fun. And what's cool about this is that your original lines do get preserved but they just get pushed back into uh, into shadow. And again, even though I'm using a water brush, I'm still reobserving. I'm still going back to that idea of, of proportion, movement, and balance that I set out in the gesture. I'm always trying to reinforce the form and the movement. This figure needs a little bit of cast shadow, so I started uh, indicating cast shadow. And when you're doing any kind of lighting, it's um, it's a very logical process. You think a bit um, if you can if you can think of it as a as a form that has light on it, you're you're in pretty good shape. The light has to adhere to the form. And you've already been analyzing the form, so anything you do with the light has to go back to what you've kind of set up with the structures. And the water brush kind of actually does what a uh, what a blending stump does. Um, if you're doing a charcoal drawing, most people use a uh, a blending stump to uh, smooth out to smooth out tones and to blend 
value transitions together. But really what it's good for is just um, defeating a little bit of, like reducing the severity of your marks and defeating the texture of the paper, working, working with the texture of the paper. Um, so if you were doing charcoal drawing, this is when you would bring out the, the blending stump and just kind of take a pass through the drawing. <coughs> And by simply putting a tone over things in the background, it uh, pushes the foreground elements up. And one of the things to pay attention to is positive and negative space. Um, positive space is, is any space that the figure takes up, and negative space is what's around the figure and, and beside the figure. And here we're moving into the, uh, the final stages of, of each of these drawings. And uh, I call this stage the binding stage. And this is the stage that you do anything that you need to do to clean up the drawing, right? The, a lot of the marks are kind of uh, disconnected. There's no real uh, identifiable contour yet. So <coughs> I can begin to use bits of contour to define all these forms, but only where I need it. If you were to go around and put a heavy outline around the entire figure, um, it would flatten everything, and that's not what you want to do. You want to um, use these contours to uh, uh, continually increase the amount of form and not decrease. So again, we're going to do the same thing: go through and find elements of find elements of contour. Um, I realized that I made this figure too skinny, so um, I had to bring out the edge there. And here um, I'm finding cast shadow uh, on the feet, switching back and forth between water and, and uh, ink. Making sure that the overlap of form is, un is understandable. And then this is always fun, just to make sure that you've grounded the figure, you can make um, a very dark value um, wherever their f the figure touches the surface of the ground. And then here I'm pulling in a little bit of cast shadow, just to make sure that everyone knows that the uh, figure is up on its toes. And you'll notice that a lot of this figure isn't really bound yet. The forms are protruding and receding, which is fine, but without them being connected to each other, um, it's not a complete uh, sketch. So you just take one more pass through and do your final, uh, the final cleanup. In your typical everyday drawing style, the contour and binding stage comes first. Most people will draw a contour and then fill it in with shading. Um, and that's not really the way you want to go. So the analytical process goes in reverse order. You do uh, value and everything first, and then you come back and find the contours at the end. And because you've learned so much about the figure through exploring movement and proportion, balance, and gesture, uh, by the time you get to the stage where you're looking for a contour, you kind of know where everything is, needs to be and is going to be. So it eliminates a lot of the pressure between each step and uh, eliminates a lot of the guesswork. guesswork.
So um, again, you're just coming back to clean everything up, find, find your final positive and negative shapes, um, figure out exactly where the figure is and define it. Um, 